as you know, the first seminar of the semester in person was going to be Dr. Cabrera from UTEP, but his flight was problems, it's canceled, so we ended up in Zoom. So Dr. Daiti will be the first oh, really? in, pres in presence meeting, you know, which feels really good. Uh, uh, so I would like to introduce Dr. Baya Daiti. Uh, he's, uh, he got his uh, undergrad education in the ITT in, in Bombay. And then he moved to the University of Michigan for, for the PhD. He, they work in electron microscopy and other things. And then he joined the University of New Mexico. Uh, he mentioned 38 years ago. <laughs> and Dr. Uh, Dyke, the A safe guess is uh, possibly was not born. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, certainly was not. <laughs> <laughs> I said most. I mean, my second recognition. <laughs> so, so then, then Dr. Deity became very, very well known in the catalysis world. He's one of the top researchers in catalysis. He has a lot of connections with real catalysis, as you see, from the, and the industry, but also from the academic point of view, he's extremely well respected scientist. He is partly a fellow electron microscopy. So, uh, that's the one thing, and I just want to say thank you, Dr. Daiki, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So considering that, uh, I don't know how well this auditorium, you know, carries sound, but I'd say you can be um, confident that I'm not going to bite you, so you can come closer if you like, so you can see here. I see a lot of empty seats, so we can have a dialogue and make it more uh, two-way. So I'm happy to stop and so just come closer, you know? It's okay, don't feel shy. There are lots of seats up here. So I can really then uh, relate to all of you and engage. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Ah, that's okay. <laughs> that um, could be, you know, that ultimately depends on the fields and the dipole-dipole interactions and uh, how, how it goes. And uh, so we'll talk about that with respect to atoms, you know, so it'll come now. Okay, so thank you very much for indulging with me. And uh, you can tell me if I'm not uh, standing at the right place so the Zoom people can see me, but uh, I'll try to be confined here. So. I know that many aspects of this are probably going to be outside the realm of your research because atoms you know, but what is a single atom? You might wonder, you know, atoms are always atoms, right? <laughs> so I have to explain to you this term that has come about in the field of catalysis um, in the last 10 years or so become very popular and has become the hottest area of uh, catalysis. And then you might wonder, what are these catalysts and what do I mean by industrial applications? So now I was hoping to have time to throw in some slides about those applications, but uh, Professor Yakaman <laughs> and Professor Vetton are really engaging. So they kept me busy all day. So I had no <laughs> chance to <laughs> revise my presentation. So I'll just tell you about the applications that we're working on. First of them has to do with converting natural gas from fracking into liquids. As you all know, we have an abundance today of natural gas from fracking. And that contains mostly alkanes. And if you remember some of your chemistry, alkanes are not reactive. So you have to functionalize them to convert them into something useful. So you have to first take those alkanes, convert them into olefins, and then olefins into liquids. And then you can make liquids, chemicals, fuels, everything else. Now, there is industry that is doing all that, but that's in Houston, that's in Louisiana, that's along the coast where all the refineries are, and they take you know, liquids from the ground, crude oil, and convert it into all the fuels and chemicals that we use. But what about the gas that is stranded? That's somewhere in the middle of a reservation that that gas comes out, how are you going to convert it into useful products? So I'm part of a center, C-STAR, which is, you know, C as in the active site, star, 
active site, so we call it C-STAR, it's Center for Innovative and Strategic Transformation of Alkane Resources. It's an ERC, an Engineering Research Center, it's at Purdue, and I'm involved with that. And one of the projects that I'm working on is how to take alkanes, convert them into olefins, and do that in a uh, way that is suitable for distributed manufacturing. You know, all of our current manufacturing is on the large scale. Now we are trying to make it on a small scale. So that is one application that we work on, certainly an important one. The other one that I will, you will see more of in this lecture is about cleaning the environment. So whenever you drive a car today, if it's not an electric car, it's burning a fuel. And when you burn the fuel, you produce carbon dioxide and water vapor, but you also produce some other harmful materials like carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide and unburned hydrocarbons. And they all give rise to smog and health problems as asthma and other issues. So you have a catalytic converter underneath your car that converts all those molecules into harmless nitrogen and carbon dioxide, okay? So those catalysts take up a lot of precious metals, platinum, palladium, rhodium. So one of our research projects is how to lower the requirements for those precious metals. So those are two of the applications. And my talk today will focus on how we are learning how to make those catalysts more effective and robust and industrially applicable. So I, I wrote a short piece for Nature Communications because I got invited, since I had been reviewing and writing papers on single atom catalysis, they said, oh, Nature Communications has reached its 10 year anniversary. And we want to highlight some of the important areas. So would you write a short piece on single atom catalysis? And I said, what am I going to say? So I thought I'll look forward and say, single atom catalysis may have originated as an academic curiosity. Can I make a single atom active on a support? But today it's ready for industrial application. And some of that you're trying to do in our lab, how to make them suitable for industrial application. So I put this down. I'll just show you if you want to read that, it's in Nature Communications 2019 and co-authored with a collaborator, Wargo, who is in the chemistry department at the University of New Mexico. So, so let's think about these single atom catalysts. So what do we mean by single atom catalysts? So you can see in this picture here, and I don't know that the contrast is very good, but you can see them here. You can see some bright dots and on a substrate which has those lines. Those lines are the lattice fringes of cerium oxide. So in this case, the catalyst support is cerium oxide, CO2, and those bright dots are platinum, okay? So first of all, what is the origin of the term single site? Should it be called single atom or single site? Now, organic chemistry, organometallic chemistry has been using single site catalysts for a long time. Most of the polymers you use today, the plastics, they are made with single site catalysts. That was a big advance many years ago. But now we are doing that on catalyst supports. So this is a powder, a bulk material, cerium dioxide, on which we have deposited platinum. And we know that the platinum is only present in the form of isolated atoms. There are no nanoparticles, no clusters, only atoms, okay? And how do we know that? Well, I'll show you the rest of the story. So, but the question is, how can we make this industrially uh, suitable? So they should be easy to prepare, single atom catalyst. It's not good enough if you do it in a careful, Schlenk line, controlled environment. We want to do it in the air. We want to do it under normal conditions with normal precursors. So that's one of the challenges. How about a high loading? Typically, you want to do a lot of chemistry in a given volume because in most industrial systems, the cost is the reactor. Okay. So you have to pack a lot of activity in your automotive catalytic converter. The gases should go fast and they should all be converted. So you need the reactivity. So you need a high loading. So how do I get a high loading, but prevent those atoms from coming together and forming clusters? So our goal is to keep them separate because why? We want to make every atom active, right? If I make a nanoparticle, and I learned today from uh, Rob, right? Mm -hmm. He said, 
they make 145 atom clusters. Now that 145 atom cluster has only, it's about 1.5 nanometers. So perhaps maybe, you know, 20%, I don't know, 50%, however many atoms are on the surface. So you have 60, okay. So 60% of the atoms are on the surface, as you know from the structure. 60 atoms, sorry, not percent. Oh, 60 atoms are on the surface. 20 percent. 20 percent. That's what I was thinking about. I'm thinking yeah, more like 20 percent. <laughs> okay. So always give the units. Yeah. So 60 <laughs> atoms out of the 140 are on the surface because he, I know, I should have known. He said there are exactly that many ligands. So I should have known the answer. Okay. Now imagine if it was palladium, which costs thousands of dollars per ounce, or rhodium is even more. Imagine you're wasted you know, 80% of the atoms, even in that small cluster. So how can you make every atom catalytically active? Only if you space them out, you put them on the support. So that's the whole idea here. How can we make single atoms, but spread them out on the support? And then as I'll show you, they've got to be stable and work. If they're going to be put in your car, they want to last 20 years, 30 years, right? So you don't want them to lose catalytic activity. And so that's the challenge. So thermal stability, why? Because you're going up a mountain pass and you're trying towing a trailer or something else. And you are pumping in a lot of gasoline and a lot of exhaust and your catalyst temperature goes up and there go your catalysts, you know, it loses activity. So you need thermal stability. And then you want to achieve selectivity. That's very important for all of the catalysis. How can you tune the oxidation state ligands? And ultimately, how can you make them multi-component? How can you have today, Professor Yakaman was showing me nanoparticles with five different metals. Now, could we make those five different metals all on the surface, working in tandem, doing different chemistry? That's the direction we are trying to go into. So and what I want to show you is these are also quantitative. Electron microscopy got a bad rap. What happens is when you take a picture, it's a small region of space. How do you know it's representative of the entire sample? That's something which I've struggled with for my entire career. I want to make the microscopy relevant to industrial catalysts. That means even though I'm looking at just one small region, I want it to reflect the average property of that entire sample, which may be kilograms or tons. So here's what we do. We can count the number of atoms in the square. Here is five nanometer by five nanometer, 25 nanometer. And I count them and I say divide by 25 square nanometers. And what do I get? One atom per nanometer squared. So this catalyst has a loading of one atom per nanometer squared, which I know from the TM image. But I can also measure the surface area of that entire catalyst. And I know from wet chemistry, bulk elemental analysis, how much platinum there is. And I divide the two when I get the same answer. So if I get the same answer, then I know that my characterization is representative of the entire sample. So this is what I try to do. When I referee a paper and it comes to me with an image, I say, have you done the math? Have you done the balance? Don't show me a picture with lots or very few, which is not consistent with your entire sample. So that's what I say. Electron microscopy is a great technique which looks at the very small scale, but we have to make it relevant to the entire sample. You know, you can't just focus on that. So, all right, there are other people who also wrote similar articles as another group from ETH in Zurich. And they said, oh, single atom catalysis has seen a decade of stunning progress. So there's another paper. I just want to point out, this is some of the historical landmarks of single atom catalysis, but the term was actually invented around 2011. That's when it happened that somebody said, oh gosh, I've got individual platinum atoms and they're active for C oxidation. So people said, wow, this is real. It's not just, but it has been happening for a long time before. And way before this, people who were making catalysts were putting atoms on the surface, but they just couldn't see them. So it is possible today to talk about single atom catalysts only because we can see them. Before that, it was just an inference. It was an indirect, and that's the beauty of electron microscopy. So now here's a funny one. Uh, I reviewed a paper in which uh, they were making a new method to put lots of these atoms, single atoms. So I thought uh, I had to write a news and views. 
So, um, you know, I said, what do we do now? So I had my colleague, uh, collaborator, John Regalbuto, and he took the Beatles song, you know, where are all the lonely people? Yeah. And he said, let's ask, where are the lonely atoms? And they're not lonely anymore. So I'm looking here, very few lonely atoms, you know, most of the atoms are next to each other. So this is what happens today. We'd like to make catalysts that have lots of atoms, but that are still separate and not forming those clusters because those clusters bury a lot of the atoms inside in the interior. We want them all on the surface. So that's really the challenge we're after. Okay, so since you don't make catalysts, all of this doesn't mean anything to you. So I'll just tell you about our method. It's called atom trapping, okay? There are lots of ways to make catalysts and they'll end up with a collection of nanoparticles of different size and single atom species, but that's not good enough. What we want something is, really reproducible and something we can relate to the catalytic behavior. So we came up with this method we call atom trapping. Basically, here's the following. Can we have sites, places on the surface? Think of that as those chairs. You're all sitting on the chairs. You're not sitting between the chairs, right? If those atoms had a place to sit and they were stable and happy, you could have a catalyst that's a single atom catalyst that it will work for a long time. So we said, let's understand what keeps these atoms trapped and how can we do that reliably on a large scale, okay? So this was their method. It was called two-step annealing, but I don't think it's going to work at the temperatures that we have to go to. And I'll tell you why. And uh, Professor Yakaman asked me today, okay, what temperatures do you want to take your catalyst to? And I said, here's the challenge. You know, DOE has a challenge out there called the 150 degree challenge. And it is that all the pollutants that come from your car, 90% should be converted by 150C. You might say, how does that compare with today's technology? But well, today they have to go to 250C or so because your catalytic converter has to warm up. Your car has to warm up. The tailpipe has to get hot before the catalyst starts cleaning up. It means the first 30 seconds to 45 seconds where all the pollutants escape, okay? So if we could start the catalyst working early, you will have, and it may not make any difference in flag stuff. You don't have too many cars. So the air quality is very good. But go to a crowded city, Mexico City, go to Bombay, go anywhere. So many cars, there's so much pollution. Every time you start a car, the engine is cold. The catalyst is not doing its job because it needs to be hot, okay? So we want catalysts that are going to work, but at the same time, these catalysts must be able to survive the harsh conditions. What are those harsh conditions? Well, the auto industry has developed protocols. And one of the protocols is take the catalyst and heat it at high temperatures. So I had collaborators at Tulsa in the Delphi Catalyst in those days. Then it became Omicor. It used to be called Allied Signal Environmental Catalyst and so on. But here's what happens at 900 degrees. Your pipes become red hot, okay? So, you have to subject your catalyst to these sorts of conditions before any manufacturer will take your catalyst seriously and put it into the car, okay? This is what we are dealing with. In fact, we find that these protocols, if you don't make your catalyst work at that temperatures, it's not gonna survive in your car for 200,000 miles, okay? So what happens to platinum and aluminum? If I take platinum and aluminum, oh, nice sub nanometer particles, and I heat it up at 800 degrees, which is the aging temperature for diesel oxidation catalysts. Here's what happens. You get hundreds of nanometer platinum particles. So platinum easily moves under these conditions and becomes extremely large. So this was the challenge we started. And we said, well, what can we do to prevent this process from happening? One question, so the gas in your car gets that hot? Yes, the gas may not get to 800, but there are, see, it's very hard to measure the temperature because when you have an exotherm, you don't know what the local temperature is. But the auto manufacturers, um, what they do is they look at the highest temperature, okay? And then they make extrapolations and say, okay, if I want the car to have multiple of those encounters over its lifetime, what temperature should I do the test? So this is accelerated aging. Right, so this is accelerated. This is not the temperature in your exhaust. And when you but, stop pumping gas, is when you get yeah. So when you stop pumping gas and the car cuts out the fuel, 
then there's only air left and there's a little bit of hydrocarbon. It burns and becomes an exothermic and goes up and you get the worst condition for the catalyst. It's called the fuel cut, which we all do to save on the gasoline, on consumption. Okay, so this is the DOE protocol for platinum diesel catalysts. I won't even tell you what it is for three-way catalysts, the ones that are using your car. Your automobiles that you drive are working under stoichiometric conditions. Diesel works under lean conditions, so the temperatures are lower. They don't go through those cycles. For diesel, it's 800. For cars, it's close to 1,000 degrees or even higher. Imagine taking your catalyst, your nanoparticles, or anything you have, put it at 1,000 degrees for 50 hours. At the end of it, you then give it to your friends at uh, Fiat Chrysler or Toyota and say, please check my beautiful creation. Is it going to work? Well, if it doesn't work, they say, come back, try again. Okay. So what happens at those temperatures? Well, things are volatile. People go to the gas phase. You know, these atoms, we think of platinum as a solid where platinum reacts with oxygen and forms platinum oxide. And the platinum oxide vapor pressure is 10 to the minus eight atmospheres. That's in the terms of Langmuir, more than 10 monolayers a second. So if I take a platinum catalyst, put it in air, it's losing 10 monolayers per second. Well, pretty soon it goes somewhere else, condenses, it forms that large particle. So in no time you have lost catalytic activity and it's not working as well. So. It, this is true of platinum, palladium, everything. This is a paper from John McCarty, and uh, it's just thermodynamic calculations telling you that we're going to have to deal with vapor phase transport. So what we are finding is this is how catalysts are degrading. So when we first started working on this, you know, most of my colleagues in the auto industry said, oh, no, there is no platinum on the roadside. It's all in your car. So it's not going there. I said, well, how am I going to prove it to you? I said, let's make a model catalyst. So we took a thin film of silicon nitride and oxidized it from silica, made a model catalyst, and we heated up only up to 750. And in two minutes, a lot of the platinum was gone. So we know that platinum evaporates. As long as it's a thin film and you have air flowing over it, it just goes into the vapor phase. So there's no question that platinum is volatile. We are using this method to measure the vapor pressure of all of these metals because you don't know them. You don't quite know what is happening under realistic conditions. So right now, that's what we're doing. But this was the work that uh, Tyne Johns did. And we used this method. These model TM samples were developed by Hans Niemann's word rate at Eindhoven and Chalmers Institute also in technology in Sweden. They developed this approach and we use them. Nowadays, they're very common. You can find them. So, so we are struggling hard to contain this platform, to prevent it from going to the vapor phase. And what we learned through the work of Christian that palladium oxide, which is added to these diesel oxidation catalysts. So diesel oxidation catalysts all contain platinum and palladium. Industry uses it, but they don't quite know what is the mechanism. How does it actually work? So we did the following experiment and I'll show you this result. We took a model catalyst of palladium oxide and then we evaporated platinum on it. And so we had thousands of particles of platinum in conjunction with the palladium oxide. And then we heated it up only for two minutes at 650 degrees. And you notice all the platinum was gone. And we said, where did it go? Did it go to the vapor phase? And we found out, no, it actually formed the bimetallic platinum palladium. So this platinum vaporized and the diffusion distance was very short. So it got picked up by the palladium oxide and you converted the palladium oxide to metallic platinum palladium. So this was the process that I described here. So we learned that trapping of atoms is real. It happens and it can happen with palladium oxide. So we said, this is the mechanism by which palladium oxide must be helping to keep this catalyst function. That's what diesel oxidation catalysts do. And so we are very happy with that result but then we went further and said, oh, we want to know what happens to a platinum palladium metallic catalyst under these conditions. How does it grow in size? How does it center? How is the ripening happening? So we made a model catalyst of platinum and palladium and we heated it up and we found that some particles grew bigger and other particles disappeared, okay? So 
this was contrary to what we expected, okay? What did we expect? It turns out if you go to McCarty's original paper, okay, palladium is very stable in the form of oxide. So at 800 degrees, its vapor pressure is very low. You know, at 800 degrees, we are down here. It is orders of magnitude lower than platinum. So palladium oxide should have no vapor pressure. It should not escape at all. It should stay rock solid, okay? What would happen when I put platinum and palladium together? We thought that, you know how, this is palladium oxide. How do I know it's palladium oxide? It's a covalent bond. It's a solid that doesn't have the same surface. You see, it's irregular. It doesn't look the same as a metallic particle. Metallic particles always look nice and round because surface energy is minimized and they become spherical. But covalent solids like palladium oxide, they can be very irregular because they don't have the ability to diffuse and become low in surface energy. So we can tell that palladium oxide is very stable at 800 degrees. It should not evaporate, nothing should go away. However, when we made a platinum palladium catalyst and we aged it for just 650C, we found we expected that the palladium would be left behind and the platinum would go away. But instead, they both disappeared. So then we said, oh, both platinum and palladium are mobile under these conditions. And it's not just platinum that is moving, palladium is moving too. But then how does this catalyst actually work? And so we have done, and this is not published yet. I don't have, the, these pictures are a little hard to see, but I can show you by X-ray diffraction, what we are learning is if I make a platinum palladium catalyst, and this has been aged for, you can see the caption, aged at 800 degrees for 50 hours. So after heating at 800 for 50 hour, if I have a palladium only catalyst, palladium, I see a PDO, okay? And it's a broad peak. So for those of you who know X-ray diffraction, a broad peak means small particles, okay? What happens to the platinum by itself? If I take platinum, it forms very sharp peaks, which means large domains, just like I showed you. So platinum will form large domains at 800 degrees. Palladium will stay small because it's a solid. Uh, it has a very low vapor pressure, almost negligible. What happens when I put platinum and palladium together? You know, there's palladium oxide there, but also I see a small peak of platinum and palladium. And you can see it here. Uh, you can see there's a slight shift in the lattice constant. Platinum, platinum, palladium, right here. Okay, so very small peak. So that means it indeed works. Industry figured it out. Adding palladium helps to keep the platinum small, but we still don't have an answer. Why does it work? Because we know that platinum palladium metal catalyst is also growing in size. So only recently, now we have a nice aberration corrected TM and we can look at thick regions because the beauty of a stem is that you can look through a sample and only get a picture of the surface or the thin region. That's why you get single atom catalyst pictures because you only look at that near region. So we were able to actually study on alumina samples heated at 800 degrees in air for 50 hours. And we found lo and behold, there's a metal and an oxide coexisting with a perfectly coherent interface. Okay. So these particles are biphasic. I call them Janus particles. One face of it is metallic, one face of it is oxide. Well, how does that fit into our mechanism of ripening? Well, here's a cartoon. Platinum and palladium both emitted to the vapor phase, but they get captured by the palladium oxide. And there's a thermodynamic equilibrium between those two phases that keeps them together. And this is a continuous cycle which goes on in your diesel oxidation catalyst, and it functions for years. Except when you're Volkswagen, then you do something wrong and you get caught for cheating. But other than that, all of the companies use this technology of platinum palladium because in diesel oxidation, you have to oxidize everything and then reduce the nitrogen oxides. That's the technology that's used. Okay, so what have I shown you so far? That platinum by itself will form huge particles. Put platinum and palladium together, it remains reasonably sized. Reasonably sized meaning, okay, 20 nanometers. They are not single atoms, they're 20 nanometers. But the mechanism that's underlying it involves transport of atoms, the capture of the atoms, and then keeping them and lowering the vapor pressure. Think of it this way. 
whenever you buy any electronic component, like a camera, all right, or a cell phone, in the packet is a little packet called, uh, says do not eat. Have you seen that? <laughs> okay, you know what that is? It's silica gel. Why did they put silica gel in every packet that they ship you any electronics? To keep it dry, to cut down the water vapor. Okay, think of this palladium oxide as that silica gel. Okay, it's suppressing the vapor pressure of platinum and palladium. So the name of the game in these high temperature reactions is how can I lower the vapor pressure? I cannot do it by simple alloying. If I make platinum and palladium together and I make a bimetallic, you know, if it's an ideal solution, maybe it's 50%, so the vapor pressure will drop by 50%. But that's not enough. I can't keep this catalyst stable for 50 hours by just lowering the vapor pressure by a factor of two. I got to lower it by orders of magnitude, okay? So I need a getter. I need something that is there and is capturing that plant. This is our model. To be written, papers yet to be submitted, but it's here. I think we have all the data to show that atom trapping does play a role in keeping catalysts stable at high temperatures, and in fact, may allow us to get tandem catalysis. Imagine we have the opportunity to have a metal phase and an oxide phase under conditions where thermodynamics, we should say, only the oxide is stable. Because under these conditions, you either get separate platinum particles that are huge, or palladium will only form palladium oxide. And here we have both platinum and palladium. We know, we have done EDS, we have done mapping of this, and we were surprised to see that there were also platinum atoms in that palladium oxide. There is no phase in the phase diagram telling you that platinum goes into palladium oxide and forms a solid solution. Well, it's entirely possible because the coordination geometry of platinum with four oxygens is identical to palladium with four oxygens. So now I have samples that I've just prepared and set for XAFs, and I hope to be able to show that this platinum is in the same sites as palladium oxide, and we know it's stable because we heat it to 800 degrees for 50 hours, and some of it stable. So I think we finally have an answer to understand what keeps these catalysts stable, thermally stable, and now let's move on to the real part of my talk, which is how do I keep single atom stable? So I showed you how to keep nanoparticles stable at 800 degrees. Now let's see what happens whenever you have a nanoparticle. So let's take a nanoparticle of uh, 146 atoms, right? of palladium or platinum or whatever. You put it in a reactor in an industrial process, you heat it up, it undergoes what's called Oswald ripening. So it emits atoms that can migrate over the surface or they can go through the gas phase as I just showed you in the case of platinum. They can go through the vapor phase or they can go through surface diffusion. The point is the large particles pick them all up. Why is this happening? There's a thermodynamic driving force. If you have heard of the Kelvin equation or the Gibbs-Thompson equation, you know that at the nanoscale, the chemical potential goes up. The fugacity goes up, the vapor pressure goes up. It can go up by orders of magnitude. So when the nanoparticle becomes small, its chemical potential is high because of the pressure. A small particle has inherently a surface tension. The surface tension compresses that nanoparticle. It's at a high pressure and it emits those atoms. So that's why they go and the large particle has a lower chemical potential. It attracts them. This is the normal rule, right? The rich get richer and the poor particles ultimately go to zero, right? This is the process. And we studied all these industrial catalysts and we finally concluded this is the dominant mechanism. It is not migration of particles, Brownian motion and forming large particles. It's always migration of atoms. So we wrote a review article many years ago, which is how do catalysts sinter? If you talk to anybody in industry, they'll tell you, what is your biggest challenge? How to keep my catalyst stable? Okay. Selective, stable, and active, right? The stability plays a very important role in all industrial catalysts. So we're dealing with this process. What can we do to those atoms? Well, I've already given you an answer. Trap them. <laughs> if you can trap them somewhere, you can prevent them from moving around. 
right? How do we do it? So we said, here's a challenge and also an opportunity. The opportunity is there are lots of mobile items. Any catalyst you heat up to any practical temperature and gold, by the way, I heard a lot about gold. Gold will start moving at room temperature. If you take gold nanoparticles and put them on TiO2 and leave the bottle in your lab and you come a year later, the gold particles have grown in size because gold has a very high mobility. So those atoms are emitted and they grow. Platinum is much more robust and so it survives much longer. So there are always mobile atoms. Now, how do we trap them? I already showed you palladium oxide is a great trap, but it's a unique one because it reacts and forms the platinum palladium oxide and platinum. What about other oxides? Well, the, in the catalysis field, we use many oxides, but we decided to look at cerium oxide because cerium oxide is used as an oxygen storage component. So all cars have cerium oxide and cerium oxide is very good because, you know, I told you in a three-way catalyst, you have to go oxidizing and reducing. Oxidizing to get rid of carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons, reducing to get rid of nitrogen oxide. You have to do all those three reactions. It's called a three-way catalyst. So while you don't know it, while you're driving your car, the engine control system is constantly changing the air fuel ratio to go right at stoichiometric, a little bit reach, a little bit rein, little bit, constantly doing that while you're driving your car to get rid of all three pollutants, okay? So you've got to be at stoichiometric conditions to be able to do that. Well, how do you do oxidation reactions when you are less oxygen? There comes cerium oxide. So cerium oxide is known to transform from four plus to three plus. So it has two oxidation states. It's a reducible oxide. So it can give up the oxygen, it can get back the oxygen. So it's a great material. It's there in every three-way catalyst. So we said, let's find out if we can do it. So I had a master's student, you know, and I said, here's a simple project. Take the platinum catalyst, throw in some cerium oxide, let's heat it up to high temperatures. Let's find out what happens. Well, what we learned was it's perfect. The cerium oxide traps every platinum atom on the edges, just on the step edges of Cedia 111. And here's the TM image to prove it. Now, of course, I would never take these TM images too seriously, right? Because how many of such atoms can I find in any given picture, right? Very few. But of course, then you have to rely on the bulk techniques. You rely on density functional theory to do the calculation. And so our collaborators helped us to do the calculations and said, this platinum has a stable site on the edge. So this is the top view of a 111 cerium oxide. And you can see at the edges, it is uncoordinated. It doesn't have all the oxygen neighbors that you have in the bulk. So cerium oxide 111 will have oxygen neighbors right here, right? It's got oxygen neighbors. This is the cerium, these are the oxygen. But at the edge, it doesn't have enough oxygens. So our model was that platinum, which I showed you is platinum oxide, it looks like CO2. It's a linear molecule. It's coming from the gas phase and getting trapped. So it brings two oxygens with it, and the two oxygens come from the edge, and you get a perfect fourfold site, and this is the process then that happens. So we learned the process of atom trapping. And of course, what happened was when we published this, science loved it. So it was published and now it has thousand plus citations. So it didn't take too long because it's the most reproducible experiment. Anybody can do it, right? Take a platinum catalyst, throw in some cerea, heat it in the air, 800 degrees, all the platinum goes and forms single atoms. So we said, we finally learned how to make stable single atoms. We said, great, success. And we can characterize it. We can do x halves we can know the nearest neighbors, know exactly how many oxygens you have, and we have fitted all and done everything. But then was the question, what happens if you go above the limit? You know, if you have a lot of platinum, eventually what will happen is you satisfied all the sites. And there are no more sites left. That's when you start to see a small platinum peak. So we found in this particular sample, when from three weight percent to four weight percent, we start to see a little platinum diffraction peak. That means all that excess platinum is now going into the large particles. But at the same time, you have all these small single atoms and you can see them here. 
This is the challenge with electron microscopy. The contrast from the substrate can be very strong. You have to look off the zone axis where you don't have channeling contrast. Then you can see the single atoms. And that's why you need an aberration corrector microscope to see this. Okay, so you go past the limit, then what happens? Then you make large particles. They're faceted, they're beautiful. They're all over, you can see them by ICM. So what this tells us that if we add more platinum than can be accommodated, it's going to end up forming large particles because that's what thermodynamics is telling you. So, but the interesting part is there's coexistence of large particles and small particles. So in this case, the small particles are not capturing all the atoms as you would have expected from Oswald ripening. You know, why did Oswald ripening not happen? Because that platinum, you know, on the step edge was more stable than any small cluster. So when we wrote this paper, the reviewer said, oh, you're telling us you've got a lot of single atoms, but what about dimers, trimers, four atoms, larger clusters? And we said, we don't see them, why? Well, if you do a DFT calculation, our collaborator told us, well, it just doesn't have the geometry. The binding energy is too low, so these will easily diffuse and disappear and form large particles. So in our hands, this is a perfect way to make single atom catalysts, thermally stable. All right, great. Is this process only going to happen through the vapor phase? So we said, what about other metals? Like what about palladium? I just told you palladium has a vapor pressure that eight orders of magnitude below platinum in air. 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus 16, okay? Huge difference. So would we be able to get atom trapping of palladium? And what about others like rhodium? And so I had an ambitious undergraduate student. When he was an undergraduate, I said, here's another nice project. Take Syria and throw in a whole bunch of elements in the periodic table. And let's find out what happens. So what we know, take cerium dioxide, heat it up to 800 degrees, it loses surface area. Now measurement of BET surface area is very easy and undergrad can do it. So he said, great, I can do this experiment by myself. So he measured the BET surface area and then he knew from our previous work, if we add platinum, the surface area is better, it's higher. So platinum helps to stabilize the cerium because it's spinning the surface sites so these dopants are helping to keep small crystals of cilia. They don't grow large, okay? In some cases, they may go to the grain boundaries. You can see this picture very well. You should have used different colors. But the point is that we said, this is a combinatorial experiment. We threw in a whole bunch of elements and we just measured the physical BET surface area. What is the surface area of the sample? And we found all of these elements were being trapped and we went to low energy ion scattering, we use every possible means and said, oh yeah, they're atomically dispersed. So we said, atom trapping that we are talking about is universal. It works in many cases, but not every case. For example, iron and cobalt, just the opposite effect. It causes the cilia to sinter and make large particles. So it can go both way. It can act as a sintering aid or it can stabilize the solid because of pinning of defect sites and keep them from surface diffusion. So it works both ways. So great, we can do atom trapping. It works for all of these metals. Why does it work? If you look at the density functional theory, we'll tell you that if you have a four-fold site, and these are octahedra that were prepared in Constantine Nyman at Barcelona, did the DFT calculation. So he created a crystal like this, and he said, put any kind of atom on the top, and let's find out how strongly is it bound compared to the nanoparticle. So here's a comparison of the heat of adsorption on the four-fold site on Syria compared to the heat of adsorption on the metal nanoparticle. And interestingly, all of these elements have a stronger binding than the nanoparticle. So that explains the mystery, why we can make single atoms on Syria, because they're actually thermodynamically more stable than the nanoparticle. So the tendency in catalysis is to make nanoparticles and make large particles. Now you can see we can actually make single atoms easily. So how can we make use of this? Well, one is CO oxidation. We did measurements of CO oxidation. 
we found that rhodium was good, palladium was great, well below 150, we're getting good onset of reactivity, but platinum was terrible. And that was our first catalyst that we worked on. And we said platinum is almost as bad, well, as low reactivity as Syria itself. So it was not doing any reactivity. And then I had a research scientist in my group, and he said, but if I take the same catalyst, which has very low reactivity, and heat it in CO and form nanoparticles, it is now active at room temperature and well below 150, it's completely converted all the carbon monoxide. So we said, how did that happen? Well, it turns out in this particular example, the nanoparticle is better than the single atom. So even though the single atom looks nice, atomically dispersed, the nanoparticle is better. I can tell you why. It has all to do with the reaction mechanism. But this is a reversible process. That's the best part. So I can take this catalyst, heat it in air, even at 600 degrees, and it goes right back to this state. And I can reduce it in CO, and it goes into this state. So we finally have a regenerable, stable catalyst that goes from single atom to nanoparticle and back. And it can be happening right there in your car, because your car is constantly going from oxidation to reduction. Okay. So this is part of the story that I was going to tell you. And I have 10 more minutes left, or I don't know when I'm supposed to end, but I'll just tell you that there are mechanistic reasons why the nanoparticle is better, and it has to do with the ability of Cydia to provide oxygen at the interface. So it turns out that the oxygen at the interface plays a big role in facilitating the reaction on the nanoparticles. We don't fundamentally change the properties of the nanoparticles. So nanoparticles on alumina don't do this. The nanoparticles of Syria do it, but if we deplete the nanoparticles of the surrounding oxygen, then they behave very differently. So this is some of the insights we got. We can go forward. I don't think I can skip all of this. So now applying it to real world catalysts. So we have a project right now, which is supported by the Department of Energy and the Vehicle Technologies Office. And the goal is greatly reduced PGM content. So we said, can we apply atom trapping to real world catalysts? We are doing that now. And it, of course, involves a lot more people than just my lab. So we've been collaborating with Yong Wang at, P uh, at WSU, Washington State University. But now we have people from BASF, from Stellantis, from Pacific Northwest National Lab, and my group here. And what we're doing in this work is applying the same methods of atom trapping to real world catalysts. So, BSF gives us their realistic support and so said, let's try them out. And it's not that easy because they, we have to push them to 980 degrees and they don't always survive. But here we are. So we said the fundamental science that we learned from the basic energy sciences funded. Now we are applying VTO funding, vehicle technologies office, and our collaboration. Ultimately, by next year, we want to put it in a real catalytic converter. So this is the direction we're going. We have to scale up our methods. It's not so simple. Can we scale up these methods of atom trapping? Indeed, we can. So we made large batches up to a 10 gram scale. And by end of this year, we have to go to 100 grams. So we've got to be able to make samples on a large scale. So then BSF can put them in their systems. And then Stellantis will put them ultimately in a wash coat and they'll go into a catalytic converter. So this is the process that I was telling you from academic lab to an industrial application. So I think in summary, what I've shown you is that surprisingly, this is exactly opposite of what you would have expected. Heating transition metals in air, it causes single atoms to be trapped. We just have to learn now how such trapping sites may be provided on other catalyst supports and be finding it's possible. Perovskites, spinels, and looking at many other oxides that may have a similar possibility of trapping atoms. And if we know how to do them correctly, we might be able to make regenerable catalysts that keep self-regenerating and keeping their properties. And several of these metals in single atom form are good, others are not so good. So we have to learn why, but we know that platinum in ionic form is not so good, but platinum in metallic form is good, no problem we can convert easily from metal to single atom and back. So it works out fine. And so this is where we were. So I think 
what I want to end, and I have many more parts of this talk, but it all depends on you know how much time I take to explain some of this. So here, I just want to leave you with this thought. When you think of a catalyst, and it contains nanoparticles, and what is happening is atoms are being emitted constantly with gold at room temperature, with platinum palladium at elevated temperatures. Those atoms are going all over the support. Imagine if you have a catalyst support that's smooth atomically, just like your billiard ball it might go very smoothly and might travel from here to there and form clusters. However, if I can create traps, I could put a hurdles to prevent the diffusion, to keep trapping them thermodynamically as they are breaking their way, I would change the vapor pressure. I would change the fugacity and the thermodynamics, and therefore I can make thermally stable single atom catalysts. So the message at the end of the day is by having tools like aberration corrected electron microscopy, we finally are able to see those atoms. And now by putting them in real world catalysts, these are all powders that you can put in any industrial process. So what we are trying to do is apply the tools that we have and relate them to actual industrial catalysts. So I want to, uh, well, <laughs> here's a big cartoon we made. Sometimes we make a fancy graphics, but it still doesn't make it to the cover of the journal. So here's one case in point. We thought we had a cool graphic. We said we can trap atoms of platinum. Could we use them as a glue to create two dimensional rafts? And we were seeing those rafts. So we said, this is a great concept and it worked. We got the paper in Nature Catalysis, but we didn't get the cover. So I showed the cover as a, I think it's much easier to follow what's going on. You can imagine the logical extension of what I've shown you. If I can trap these atoms, what are they going to, they to do? They're going to change the nucleation and growth of the second phase. That's what we're starting right now. And so this is the case of palladium oxide rafts that do seem to form. We can form platinum rafts and we can see the 2D rafts and aberration corrected TM. And so we know that we have them and we can test their catalytic behavior. They behave differently. So that's all good. And then we see that every catalyst, every support that every auto manufacturer uses, they either put, they put lanthanum in it. And we go and look in the TM and what do we see? Every lanthanum atom is isolated. It's a single atom because the lanthanum is bound to the alumina. So we are thinking that also plays a role in modifying the nucleation of the palladium. So all along, catalyst manufacturers have been using these kinds of catalyst supports, but they didn't know what they looked like. They didn't know what they were at the atomic scale. Now the aberration corrected microscopy has opened up our eyes and we can actually see all those atoms and we can say, oh yeah, those atoms may be playing a role in your catalytic behavior and we can learn to manipulate them. And that's what we are after right now in my group. And the, lately we've been looking at Syria alumina and we were surprised, you know, with our microscope. So this is the microscope we have. It's a JOL DO arm and it sits in this nice new building, physics and astronomy, interdisciplinary sciences building in the basement. We had to put quarter inch thick aluminum to create a Faraday cage because of the electromagnetic fields. And it also has radiant panels to keep the temperature within 0 0.1 degrees. It's gotta be very stable and nobody's walking in that room. People are in the next door control room. And then we can get pictures like this routinely. So this is a catalyst support we got from BSF. They said, oh, here's a Syria alumina that we use in our work. And we put it in the microscope, we say, oh, your Syria alumina contains nanoparticles of Syria and single atoms coexisting. So same thing is happening just in their regular support that they didn't know it contained single atoms. So then we said, okay, this is how it's going to be. So certainly all of these tools are helping us and we are working on many other systems, but I think what I will do is uh, go forward. Uh, and uh, I won't show you this last part of the story. Let me just bring me to the end. Um, so I think we are comfortable that we can uh, certainly make um, single atom catalysts. Let me see. Okay. So I hope I've convinced you that we can make single atom catalysts with high loading that are thermally stable using scalable synthesis methods. The key is covalent bonding. How are they bonded to the support? If we understand that inorganic chemistry, we'll be able to master the science of catalyst preparation. This has not been done in the past. People haven't looked carefully at the single atom level. 
everybody's interested in putting the metal, heating it up, making nanoparticles. But what we have to tell them is, no, no, go back to the atoms and study how they move on the surface. Where are they trapped? Those are going to give you insights into making better catalysts. So that's where we are. We think single atom catalysts provide unusual reactivity. I didn't get to show you this. It's still work in progress. It has been published, but nickel atoms behave very differently from nickel nanoparticles. Nickel nanoparticles are used by industry to make hydrogen, steam reforming, but nobody worried about single atoms. Now we are learning how to keep them stable and we can show that they indeed provide unusual reactivity not seen in nanoparticles. And what we are learning is how can we play the game, dope, dope other atoms, change the neighbors and change the chemistry of that active site. So we think these catalysts are eminently suitable for industrial. And that's the message that I'm giving. How is our lab different from other labs? Well, what we want to do is make materials that I can actually give to any company and say, go test it in your reactor and tell us if it works. Okay. So to make this all function, uh, okay, what happened? Stop. Oh. No, switch down, yeah. Okay, I should thank all the people who funded this. I have funding from the Department of Energy, Basic Energy Sciences. I have had uh, interaction with industry, with uh, these goalie programs, with General Motors, Toyota, and uh, currently we are working on this with uh, BSF and doing, uh, you know, Celantis BSF ERE. I'm part of the center. I didn't get a chance to show you the work we're doing on hydrocarbon transformations, where again, these are high temperature reactions to take alkanes, which are not reactive and convert them into olefins and then to liquids. That's what we are after. So, all right, uh, let's see. Oh, I want this work. Okay, a lot of collaborations all over the world. Wherever I go, I take my samples. Or when I go to people, they give me samples to take back to the our microscope. And we build up collaborations. I'm hoping that I'm going to get some samples from Professor Yakaman and maybe some clusters. And we'll do something with them. We'll test them in our reactors and we'll find out how they function. So a lot of uh, interaction with people in Eindhoven and Purdue, Utrecht, and the companies that do these novel tools such as low energy ion scattering. It's an exquisite technique. If you want to know the surface composition of something, you shine uh, ions at very low energy and gives you the perfect, it tells you exactly what's on the surface. Not like X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, which goes deeper. This is surface only. And of course, uh, we need uh, uh, X-rays. So we go to Slack, we go to Brookhaven. And then I want to thank my mentors. You know, my professor, Johannes Schwank at the University of Michigan. And next week, I'll go there and get a chance to talk at the Michigan Catalysis Society. And these are the folks who taught me electron microscopy. And Will Bigelow is the professor at Michigan. He's still around in Ann Arbor, and he's 99 years old. And next year, he turns 100, and we're going to do a special symposium at the Microscopy Society meeting to honor him. And Larry Allard was there in the electron microscope lab that I have interacted with over the years. So I put them down as my mentors, and I think it must be the water in Ann Arbor because they all look about the same all the years that I've known them. So, And then I have uh, collaborators, one that I talk to a lot, Charlie Campbell at the University of Washington, and then Yong Wang, where we are constantly working together on these single atom catalysts. And then this is his research group from a few years ago, I think. And this is my research group with the uh, two high school teachers on the top left and some undergraduates and some graduate students. And with that, I'm gonna stop. I think I've used up all my time. Thank you. Question. We have time for two questions. Uh, Alex, but by the way, Alex used the, the microphone. I know. <laughs> so I was just curious well, with like the CEO or the oxide, um, with the platinum, if you were able to thin film across that, if that was stable enough or if that would reduce the stability. Yeah. Uh, as, you, as, as I showed you, in some favorable cases, we seem to get 2D wraps of platinum, but you know that the cohesive energy of metals is so high that when you heat them up, they want to become nanoparticles. So to keep anything as a film is very challenging. So we haven't learned it, but maybe with all your synthetic techniques, there may be ways to put the, and make uh, coatings or 2D materials. 2D materials will have very different catalytic behavior than 3D materials. So I think if you can synthesize them 
on this scale in grams and looking at them would be very nice. But we are only special cases where I think it has an oxygen bond. That's the only reason it stays stable because that platinum has to be bound to oxygen. And that's what, it's an intermediate oxidation state between zero valent platinum and platinum plus two. And same with palladium. So that's my answer. Another question? I have one. Yes, please. Um, so your palladium oxide is under strong oxidizing conditions, 800 degrees air. Hmm. How is it becoming a bimetallic particle under strong oxidizing conditions like that? Yeah, very good point. Um, I think what happens is the PTO2 that it reacts with is actually um, helping to reduce it because the PTO2 is thermodynamically unfavorable. You got to go, it's a gas phase species. Mm -hmm. So when we worked out the thermodynamics, it worked and we put it in that paper and we justified making metallic particles. And at that point, we were happy because we saw it, right? We did XPS and it was metallic. And we said, how is that happening? Mm -hmm. But platinum is known to keep things reduced. So for example, take manganese. Manganese in air or oxidizes manganese oxide, right? It's hard to keep it metallic in air if you have nanoparticles. But you make a platinum manganese catalyst, the manganese is in metallic form, alloyed with the platinum. So platinum can help reduce these oxides. So take tin, take gallium, take all of these materials that easily, gallium will be a liquid at room temperature, but I mean, many of these which would be oxide in the thermodynamically those stable cases, with platinum, they get reduced. And then you can keep them metallic. Now, this happens at 800, but you go to 900, everything's going to change, right? So at 800 is the upper limit because you go above 825 or so, palladium oxide will decompose and form palladium metal. Then everything will become metallic. So, but it so happened that the auto industry chose 800 as their aging temperature. So we stuck to 800, we said, we're not going to go up because that's what you use. So that's what we'll use. And if you can understand how these catalysts function and 800 C, if you go look at the thermodynamics published, they would say that at 800 palladium should not be an oxide, it should be a metal. But in our hands and everybody's hands we see, so thermodynamics that are bulk thermodynamics published may not apply to nanoparticles. So you gotta be careful and you have to go with your experiments. We do TGA, we do XRD, and we see palladium oxide and said, okay, fine. Your bulk thermodynamics is not applying here. It is palladium oxide. But when we add the platinum, you see it, there's a bimetallic phase. You saw it by X-ray diffraction, it's there. So now we think we can explain it based on just uh, continuum thermodynamics. We don't have to invoke anything extra. Uh, any other question? Yes, please. Um, would you be able to speak to some of the challenges that you anticipate your collaborators running into as kind of the next steps of this? Interesting. Yeah, there are many challenges, right? I mean, real world catalysts, as I said, encounter pollu uh, poisons. You know, sulfur, as you know, gasoline, diesel contains sulfur. Mm -hmm. What will that do to your catalyst, right? It, as you know, sometimes you may have felt this, you're driving a car and suddenly you get the smell of rotten eggs from the car in front of you. What's happening is the cerium dioxide is trapping the sulfur and then it's getting reduced and forming H2S. And that's a problem. I know from exhaust, you see H2S. So these sulfur, but auto industry figured out how to handle sulfur, not so well with phosphorus. So we haven't yet come up with all the solutions to the problem. They have to deal with poisons. They have to deal with the, uh, other issues that come up. So I think there'll be many more challenges, uh, but obviously we are an academic team trying to do fundamental science and then work with industry and say, okay, we send samples to industry, they test them and they tell you what works and what doesn't work. And that's the kind of the synergy we have. Okay, uh, let's, Dr. yes, please. Last. Yeah, um, you showed the science part. And you said the small particles are the best, but how much small up to be a particle? I don't know. Maybe yeah. around less than 100 nanometers. 
Yeah. So the question was, how small does a particle have to be to be good or better? Think of it this way. There are nanoscale effects where the surface energy, the surface curvature plays a role, as in the Kelvin equation. Those effects become important in the range of two nanometers and below. When you go above two nanometers, I think of those mostly as bulk. You know, the properties of the bulk apply. So then what you're dealing with, how many atoms are on the surface compared to the bulk? The ratio. So we just learned 146 atom cluster has 60 atoms on the surface. That means 60 out of the 146 are on the surface. If I make it bigger, even less. So you're wasting that precious metal. You're wasting a lot of you know, important catalytic metal. So that is why it's important. The smaller, the better, because the surface to volume ratio is good, but the smaller is also more susceptible to ripen. So that is the challenge. You want the high activity, but you want stability. I have the last question now. Baba, now you went to work, so please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to see if you would mind uh, reiterating the rationale by which you would uh, determine uh, the region of your electron microscopy images where representative of the sample surface. Could you say that again? Yeah, so here's my simple guiding principle. I just wrote a book chapter on imaging single atom catalysts. And in the last section, I said, how do we achieve rigor in our microscopy, right? So I said, take the sample, go to low magnification and take a bunch of pictures and make sure they all look similar. They have the same composition and save everything, right? If not, and whenever my student comes to me, he says, oh, this is what I saw here, but then here I saw something else. Then I said, go back and make a new sample because your samples aren't uniform and the electron microscope is not the way to get a good average because you can never average correctly down on the scale that you're looking at. The average is on the scale of tons in these catalysts, right? So you gotta make sure the sample is uniform at the different leg scales, at the scale of the SEM, at the length of the TEM, and then you go up and you take a picture and then you ask, what is the composition of the region that I imaged? If the composition of that region is not representative of the bulk elemental analysis, then you're not looking at a representative picture, right? Now, I'm not saying it'll be all the same. I just showed you a CDR particle. Obviously, there are CDR crystals and there are single atoms, right? So just back off and do a elemental analysis and you'll get 58%. So we know that sample is 58% everywhere, but 10% of it is single atoms and 40% is in the form of nanoparticles. And then we do X-ray diffraction and we check the peak of the X-ray diffraction and we do quantitative Riedfeld analysis and we get the same answer. So if the answer by bulk elemental analysis agrees with your TEM, then you can be confident that you've got a representative picture, right? This is the rigor we've got to use when using TEM. Otherwise, you get lots of pictures and people well, show one picture. Well, and I asked the student at Karlsruhe, I was visiting uh, <laughs> University of Karlsruhe and he showed me one platinum palladium core shell picture. He said, this is why this catalyst deactivates. I asked him, how many pictures did you take that showed the structure? He said one. <laughs> Let me tell you, remember <laughs> that uh, you are magnifying at five million times. Your, your sample, which is three uh, millimeters, is the size of Arizona. <laughs> so if you are looking at Phoenix, and say, all, all Arizona looks like Phoenix. No, that's a your mixer. So, so think of it this way. You <laughs> want to get an average of the views of students at Northern Arizona University. And you just look at you and say, are you representative of this whole university? Yes. No, you'll have to take a sample and collect the sample and do multiple samples and then do all the statistical tests. That's what we do. We take multiple samples, we do multiple analysis, we do the statistics and say, now we are representative. And then we feel confident in publishing it. And we don't think everybody does it. So we question yeah. them when they- <laughs> no, 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 one thing. I have a last question. As you know, gold is not uh, particularly reactive, but however, there was these papers, uh, the Japanese group that they found with this very, very small, uh, they, they are reactive and probably do you think it's more single atoms because they, they do it in gold in Syria. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, gold has been fascinating 
for people for many years now, ever since it was discovered by Haruta in Japan Haruta, that, that gold is very active for CO oxidation at room temperature. So he said, great, you know, those gold clusters and so on, people got really fascinated, but then they realized there are many other things that are happening with these gold particles. Water vapor plays a role, the support plays a role, all those things come into play. Yes, there are reactions, there are chemistries, even industrial scale, that they actually use gold, palladium and gold for reactions, right? So yes, I'm not discounting that gold may be important in many chemistries, but not the not always. It's not so simple, and you can do CO oxidation at room temperature even on platinum. We learned as long as you can avoid that poisoning problem. Okay, I think that we stop here. We can. Yes, thank you.